Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at another of Calvin's videos on the Answers in Genesis Canada channel. This one is asking the question of whether or not evolution can be observed. I'm going to go ahead and just say yes right now because evolution is happening with pretty much every generation of any organism, though I have a sneaking suspicion that Calvin is referring more specifically to the speciation aspect of evolution rather than taking a more broad approach, because even though we have observed speciation events as well, it's easier to present the information as though what we have observed isn't important if you first insist that impossibly massive changes are the only thing that could possibly count as speciation, and speciation is the only thing that could possibly count as evolution. Anyway, let's go! Now what we're going to be covering today is whether evolution is observable or whether it's not. Well, this video was published recently enough that you should be aware of a pretty big instance of observed evolution. The SARS-CoV-2 virus, originated in bats, evolved to infect an intermediate species that at this time has not been conclusively identified, and then evolved again to infect humans. I know those changes aren't big enough for you to call them evolution, but you refusing to work with the definition of evolution that scientists use when figuring out what counts as evolution doesn't actually make it not evolution. And fun fact, but the coronavirus found in bats is 96% genetically similar to the human version. Human and chimp DNA, you might recall, is roughly 98% similar. So if you're going to claim that they're still the same thing because they're still a virus, then by extension, humans and chimps are the same thing because we're both still apes. And of course there is some wiggle room with these numbers depending on how it's measured, so this might not be as valid a comparison as it sounds on its face, but it still is indicative of a goalpost shifting on the creationist part. You know, because many evolutionists, they see them almost bipolar when you're trying to, you know, get them to give an answer to this question. Come on, Calvin. I thought that we as a society had grown past the point where we were using mental health conditions as insults. Not cool, buddy. Not cool. For years, evolutionists have argued that science could demonstrate the truth of the story of evolution in quotes like the following. Actually, there is super abundant evidence for animals evolving under our eyes. British moss becoming darker since the Industrial Revolution. Insects involving DDT resistance since World War II. Malaria parasites evolving chloroquine resistance in the last two decades. And new strains of flu virus evolving every few years to infect us. Yes, those are all excellent examples of evolution. The frequency of certain alleles changed over the course of several generations to favor traits that were more beneficial to those organisms. That's evolution. The problem for evolutionists? <laughs> Christian apologetics ministries like Answers in Genesis have been educating Christians to the duplicitous tactics that evolutionists have often employed. Well, if that ain't the pot calling the kettle black, you literally work for an organization that will take out of context quotes from evolutionary biologists as evidence against evolution. Stephen Jay Gould is a frequent creationist go-to because he spent decades writing prolifically in defense of punctuated equilibrium, and as such, he frequently wrote about what he saw as problems with gradualism. But never do they continue the quote to a point where he explains a potential solution to the problem that he presented, they just cut it off at the problem and pretend like it was a groundbreaking admission by Gould that the entire theory of evolution has a massive, unsolvable problem. But yeah, the evolutionists are the ones being duplicitous. Such as the false equivocation of natural selection with biological evolution and the difference between empirical observational science and historical science. There is no equivocation between natural selection and evolution. Natural selection is a part of evolution. They are not identical. The only people who claim that they are identical are creationists when they're setting up a straw man to tear down. So now you can show that natural selection doesn't encompass everything about evolution, and then use that to try and show that evolution is wrong because of that. As to the difference between observational and historical science, there are definite differences between science that is done in laboratory experiments and science that is used to reconstruct past events, but the differences are not as pronounced as creationists like to pretend, and there is a good deal of overlap between them, where they're not independent of each other, historical science will rely on observational science, and vice versa, but creationists aren't typically concerned with the general nuance of which methods will work best under which scenarios, they instead like to equivocate between historical 
historical science and the study of history, often using analogies that involve determining what happened in human history rather than using actual hard scientific data to reconstruct a past event. And they need to do this in order to establish books as a potential source of information for historical science so that they can then hold up the Bible and say, I have eyewitness testimony, even though an actual study of the history of the Bible shows very conclusively that it was not eyewitness testimony. These people have kind of woken up to the fact that there's zero evidence of animals evolving under our eyes. Quite the contrary, the more I've looked into it over the years, the more obvious evolution becomes. Sure, we don't have all the details completely nailed down, but that's okay. It wouldn't be an area of active research if we did. In pretty much every area of science that could even possibly have an impact on evolution, we find confirmation that evolution happens, or at the very least is possible. Like, astronomy doesn't really give direct evidence for evolution, but it does show us that the universe is old enough to have accommodated it, and it's big enough to make it statistically more probable. And yet many, you know, layperson evolutionists persist in using these arguments, which even other evolutionists have debunked. Yeah, sometimes there is a problem with lay people using bad arguments. I'd argue that it happens both for evolution and for creationists. On the evolution side, this likely comes about from most people not being terribly interested in the subject, so they aren't well versed in it, but they trust that the people who spend their entire lives studying it know more than they do, so they trust the consensus of experts. If pressed on the matter by, say, a street preacher, they might attempt to give an answer to a question that they had never considered before and don't fully understand, because it's human nature to want to be able to answer in those scenarios. The creationists, however, are often misinformed and use bad arguments as a result of the more professional creationists presenting their information in a way that leads them to being misinterpreted. We've seen this a few times on this channel when responding to some of the smaller, less professional creationists. We get arguments that AIG would never make, but which clearly have their basis in a slight misunderstanding of an argument that AIG did make, with AIG never issuing a correction or a clarification because they actually want to encourage that misunderstanding, but they want to maintain plausible deniability. And a good example of this occurred recently on our Answers in Genesis Canada Facebook page, where a lady named Debbie, clearly an atheistic Bible skeptic, commented on one of our posts. Yeah, we all know that the best thought out arguments come from Facebook posts. Glad to see Calvin is choosing the best of the best here by declaring, evolution has been proved beyond a reasonable doubt many times over. Ignoring it, denying it as you do, does not change the facts. So I then responded and asked her, so evolution has been observed, has it been proven? Observed and proven are two different things. You can observe things that turn out to be wrong, and you can prove things without directly observing them. The fact that the Earth is round was proved long before we ever sent rockets into space to directly observe it, and many people, myself included, directly observe that the dress in this picture is white and gold, despite the fact that it is, in reality, black and blue. My point is, direct observation is not the only way to do science, and it's not even always the most reliable way to do science. And she said, the peppered moth is one example. Peacocks and pesticide-resistant insects are two more. I can go on. Yeah, those maybe aren't the best examples, but they do work. And we could go on. My favorite examples are the ones that come from lab experiments. Of course, creationists often dismiss such experiments as obviously being intelligently designed, so they don't count as evolution. But they ignore the fact that the experiments are designed specifically to mimic what would happen naturally, while eliminating confounding variables in order to study one thing at a time. So, for instance, in the experiment where a unicellular species of algae developed the trait of multicellularity not once but twice, independently and using two different methods, the researchers didn't do anything that would force multicellularity other than exposing the algae to a filter-feeding amoeba, which put a selection pressure on the algae to increase in size in order to avoid being eaten. And two out of five colonies ended up using multicellularity as a way to increase their size. That's a pretty big evolutionary change, and it happened quickly, and it remained a stably heritable trait for years even after the selection pressure was removed. So I sent her the following reply. Well, Debbie, you might want to look into what you believe is observational evidence for evolution somewhat further. For example, example famous evolutionary biologist L. Harrison Matthews. Pro tip, if you have to tell someone that a person is famous, then they're not. <laughs> 
If they are a famous evolutionary biologist, then you wouldn't need to say they are famous. You'd just name them and they would know them because they're famous. Now, if you're a biologist who specializes in marine mammals, you're probably familiar with him, but this is the first time I ever recall hearing about him, and I spend a lot more time reading about evolutionary biology than your average Joe, so unless I somehow manage to miss a bunch of references to this guy and his work, the word famous probably doesn't apply. Writing in the foreword to the 1971 edition of Darwin's Origin of Species said this about the peppered moth example that you mentioned. The experiments beautifully demonstrate natural selection or survival of the fittest in action, but they do not show evolution in progress. For however the populations may alter in their content of light, intermediate or dark forms, all the moths remain from beginning to end Biston Betularia. Yeah, he probably did write that there. I'm having a hard time finding that particular version of the origin of species, so I can't really confirm it. But in other places, Matthews also very strongly supported evolution. In fact, that foreword is usually quoted by creationists slightly differently because he says in another part, belief in the theory of evolution is thus exactly parallel to belief in special creation. The creationists of the McLean versus Arkansas Board of Education trial were actually planning on using Matthew's statements as evidence that creationism and evolution are equivalent and so should both be taught in a biology class, but when Matthews himself was contacted regarding the trial, he apparently wrote so scathing of a letter denouncing that position that the creationists dropped everything of his from their case lest their opponents enter that letter into the court records against them. Unfortunately, that letter did not survive, so we don't know exactly what it said, but what we can get from this is that Matthews was very much a supporter of evolution, but often worded things in ways that could be useful to creationists with a penchant for quote mining. As for the pesticide resistance argument, more than 15 years ago, leading evolutionary biologist Francisco Ayala wrote, and this was in Scientific American in uh, September 1978, that since 1947, resistance to one or more pesticides has been reported in at least 225 species of insects and other arthropods. The genetic variants required for resistance to the most diverse kinds of pesticides were apparently present in every one of the populations exposed to these man-made compounds. Yeah, so the traits that gave them resistance were already present, natural selection made them dominant. That's definitely a part of evolution. Natural selection doesn't create new traits by itself, it only selects for traits that are already there. So the fact that natural selection selected traits that were already there in this instance is completely unsurprising to say the least. You know, since that's literally its one job. So what happened was simply that the resistant ones already present survived and the other ones were killed. And the alleles that made them more resistant became more common in the population than the alleles that did not. So over successive generations, the allele frequency changed. That is definitionally evolution. The survivors passed on the genetic information for this resistance, which therefore became more common in subsequent generations. No new information arose. Didn't it? I mean, maybe it didn't arise right then and there in response to a new threat in the environment, but those genes came from somewhere, they weren't always present. Natural selection is only a part of evolution. Now, one of the other parts of evolution which does undeniably result in new genetic information is mutation. These can be single point mutations, duplications, deletions, transpositions, and probably a few other categories that I'm not thinking of at the moment. There's also horizontal gene transfer, but that mostly affects single-celled organisms, so only most of the organisms on the planet, no big deal. Yet this is what evolution is supposed to be all about. No, not all about. Remember a couple of minutes ago when you said to the duplicitous tactics that evolutionists have often employed, such as the false equivocation of natural selection with biological evolution. I am perfectly happy to point out that natural selection is only one aspect of evolution. And here you are pointing out that natural selection is not covering the whole of the theory of evolution. So somehow that's evidence against evolution. So which of us is doing the duplicitous equivocation here? In fact, some information would have been lost as a result of non-resistant organisms being wiped out, as they would have likely carry some genes not present in the survivors. Potentially, yes, but not necessarily. A change in the allele frequency of a population does not automatically mean that those with the less dominant allele all die off. In fact, often a change in the selection pressure is caused by part of the population becoming physically separated from the rest. So while they evolve to adapt to the new environment, their cousins could be right next door, chilling out in their more basal form the entire time. 
So according to the testimony of leading evolutionists, both of these examples do not show evolution in progress. They do not show the whole picture in and of themselves, but they certainly do show evolution in progress. Yet years later, the same examples are still presented as top ranking observational evidence for evolution. Yeah, but there are more than those. You guys just don't like to look at the newer ones. Above you wrote, evolution has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt many times over. Ignoring it, denying it as you do does not change the facts. And yet the examples that you have, uh, you gave to have been debunked by leading evolutionists. No, they have not been debunked. They have been caveated. Is that even a word? Well, the little person in the computer who draws the little red squiggles seems to think that caveated is a word. So we'll go with caveated. They have been caveated. This should give you pause and make you ask, why was I so confident that these, these were examples of evolution? And are there other things I believe that aren't true? While it is good to have a healthy skepticism, having had a minor misunderstanding of a term that is now clarified is not a reason to call into question everything else you believe about evolution. Now, sure, if you did have this particular misconception, then probably there are other things that you don't quite understand. But a layperson not having a complete and fully accurate understanding of evolution does not give us sufficient reason to doubt the people who have expertise in the subject. I continued and said, growing up as an atheist myself, I was offended to learn that what I had been told were rock solid examples of evolution. Wait, Calvin was an atheist? Oh, good Lord. You got one of those stories such as Piltdown Man, Heckle's embryo drawings, and the peppered moth example were fraudulent. Okay, now we know he's lying. Either that or he looks really good for a 75-year-old, because that's about how old he'd have to be to have actually had Piltdown Man given to him as an example of evolution. It was shown to be a hoax in 1953, so 75 is actually generously young because it puts him at six years old when it was exposed. Nobody lists Piltdown Man as an example of evolution. It's actually a great example of how our increased understanding of how evolution happened led us to figuring out that it was a hoax. Piltdown Man was made with a large brain, but teeth for a more primitive diet than modern humans, because at the time we thought that the brain came first and the diet came later. As we found more and more hominid ancestors, it became clear that Piltdown Man was out of place, and so it was re-examined and found to be fake. You'll never hear a creationist tell that part of the story. Now, Haeckel's embryo drawings did have some sketchiness about them, but even though Haeckel exaggerated certain features in order to provide evidence for his biogenetic law idea, they were still remarkably accurate given the technology that he had access to at the time. And the relevant evolutionary data that we were looking for in the embryos has been photographically confirmed since then. So yeah, Haeckel might have gotten some details wrong, but the more important details to the theory of evolution were found to be correct with photographs. So I don't know why you would even bother to bring this one up. And just for some clarification for those who are not familiar, Haeckel's biogenetic law was a type of recapitulation theory, which was the idea that embryos go through stages in which they become a miniature adult form of every one of their evolutionary ancestors while developing. This is now known to be wrong, and this is what Haeckel was trying to promote. And to finish it off, the peppered moth example is an example of natural selection. I think we can both agree on that, can't we? Though you do seem convinced that if something is only an example of part of evolution, then that somehow means that it's actually evidence against the rest of evolution, which is a bit of a weird jump if you ask me. Even atheist evolutionist Dr. Jerry Coyne said finding out that the peppered moth example wasn't true was like learning Santa wasn't real. That is a paraphrase rather than a quote. This is important here because he wasn't talking about the peppered moth example as a whole, but rather one of the most prominent experiments that sought to confirm the peppered moth hypothesis. Coyne was critiquing this experiment because it was rather poorly designed. Kettlewell, the researcher that he was critiquing, was releasing peppered moths of the various colors into forests, both polluted and not polluted, and then he would recapture them later to see what the ratio of the recaptured moths would be. There was very little in the way of control, and really no way to account for him just not being able to find a particular moth rather than it having been eaten by a bird. There had, both before and after Kettlewell's experiment, been other experiments that confirmed that the coloration of the peppered moths was indeed impacted by pollution, and it remains an excellent example of natural selection, as Jerry Coyne will still tell you despite this quote mine. In 2012, Coyne wrote an article titled The Peppered Moth Story is Solid that deals with this particular controversy. It's linked down below if you want to see what he actually thinks about the peppered moth story, rather than just taking this one statement that was part of a critique of a single poorly designed experiment at face 
face value. Now, she responded back and said, man, you will always find people who do not agree with what is generally accepted. Again, 97% of the scientific world accepts evolution. You believe the 3%. I stick with the 97%. Good day, no further comment. So Now, I'm sure you could dismiss this as an appeal to authority fallacy, but the thing about appealing to authorities is that when the group you are appealing to actually is a legitimate authority, it's not fallacious to make that appeal, and ideally it will be a group consensus type of situation rather than appealing to any one individual. And yes, evolution is one of the most agreed upon scientific theories there is, with, yes, 97% of scientists accepting evolution according to Pew Research. But the fact is, the average layperson with just a little apologetics training can easily poke holes in such examples like those that, you know, I've quoted here. And the fact that you think that the average layperson is going to come up with something that none of those 97% of scientists were able to figure out is really just an astonishing exercise in hubris. But of course, this again reveals the ultimate weakness with the case for creationism. It's that the case for creationism doesn't really exist. They just assume that if they poke enough holes in evolution, then creation is the default fallback position. But it really isn't. You need to make a positive case for creation, not just poke some minor holes in evolution. Holes that aren't even holes when you actually take the time to understand them. And because of this embarrassment of having to deal with the fallout, some of naturalism's foremost promoters have actually changed tactics. If there have been tactics shifts, it isn't because creationists successfully poked holes. If the shift even had anything to do with creationists, it'll just be to clarify in a way that doesn't lend itself to creationist quote mining. For example, fanatical atheist Richard Dawkins has actually admitted the following. Nobody has actually seen evolution take place over a long period, but they have seen the after effects and the after effects are massively supported, he says. I mean, the key phrase there is over a long period. We have seen evolution take place, but however much of it is directly observed, the changes that can be observed on a human timescale will never be enough for creationists, even though we have piles of evidence for the larger changes, even without directly observing them. It's like a case in a court of law where nobody can actually stand up and say, I saw the murder happen, and yet you've got millions and millions of pieces of evidence which no reasonable person can possibly dispute. I'd go farther than that. I'd say that, yeah, we might not have seen the killing blow of the murder, but I saw the murderer, let's call him Steve, 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 pulling the knife out of the victim's body while the victim said, Steve stabbed me just before dying. And then further investigation shows that all of the physical evidence points to Steve and all of the circumstantial evidence points to him as well. Oh yeah, and also there was a security camera that was pointed at the scene of the crime that clearly shows Steve stabbing the victim. But of course, (laughs) in a court of law, everybody's observing the same group of facts and they're interpreting it as evidence towards their own presuppositional position, whether they believe the person's innocent or guilty. Okay, so what you appear to be saying here is that everybody who has ever been convicted of any crime without there being a witness to the crime needs to be pardoned immediately because any evidence that isn't an actual witness could either be evidence for or against them, just depending on the person's interpretation. Do I have that right? So in our Steve scenario, the creationist juror would be saying that, yeah, sure, we have a video of Steve committing the crime, but it's not the highest quality video. And besides, have you seen deep fakes? The video must have been a fake. And sure, our witness saw Steve pulling the knife out and heard the victim say that it was Steve, but they didn't see Steve actually do the stabbing. So clearly Steve was removing the knife with the intent to administer first aid and the witness is lying about the victim's last words. Yeah, I know they can be heard on the video as well, but that's a deep fake, remember? They must have faked the victim's voice as well. Oh, what's that? The video was collected by the authorities within minutes of the crime and the position of the body in the video matches perfectly with the position of the body in real life and there wasn't anywhere close to enough time for anyone to have made such a realistic deep fake with that level of accuracy before the authorities got to the video? Well, clearly the authorities are all lying to cover it up for no apparent reason. This is the kind of desperate grasping at straws that we get from creationists. And the facts that we observe in nature make more sense when interpreted according to the biblical narrative than towards the story of evolution. No, they really don't. And in order to even make it seem like that, you need to make sure you only ever take a very superficial view of the facts, learning as little about them as possible. So here's the question, which is it? Can evolution be observed or not? Yes, it can be both observed and it cannot. It depends what scale you want to see it on, 
And creationists always demand a scale that is impossible to directly witness, and then they insist that all the evidence that points to it happening on that scale is completely worthless without the direct observation, which is just flat out wrong. I mean, if no one has observed evolution occurring in real time, it means it isn't in the realm of empirical science, which is what Answers in Genesis has always taught. And Answers in Genesis has always been wrong. Tell me, do you accept the existence of exoplanets that were discovered without being directly imaged? You know, the ones that have been discovered with indirect methods, such as the gravitational pull that they have on their star? Well, I can tell you that Answers in Genesis does accept their existence, and even marvels at how amazing it is that astronomers are able to take the precise measurements needed to make these discoveries. So why is indirect evidence acceptable for exoplanets, but not for evolution? There have only been about 100 exoplanets that have been directly imaged so far, but there are 5,059 confirmed exoplanets, with an additional 6,587 probable exoplanets that are awaiting confirmation. The vast majority of the exoplanets that we have discovered have never been directly observed, and yet AIG has no problem accepting the science here, because they seem to think that the fact that we discover more of a type of planet that's the easiest type to discover somehow proves that there are no other Earth-like planets out there that could harbor life. Just let me say that again. They think that the fact that we discover mostly exoplanets that are easy to discover means that the ones that are harder to discover just don't exist. Just let that sink in. But rather, it's a historical science where facts are open to various interpretations with the possibility of alternative explanations. To a point, yes, but not to the extent that would be required in order for creationism to be true. For creationism to work, you need to discard the findings of essentially every area of scientific research, not just biology, but geology, astronomy, cosmology, a sizable chunk of chemistry, archaeology, paleontology, anthropology, and even just plain old human history. And there's probably a few ologies that I forgot to list as well, but yeah, creationism doesn't get along with any of these sciences. The problem for creationism is that the findings of all these various sciences often have the effect of confirming findings from other fields of science. So biology will say, hey, we need a long time for evolution to have happened. Then geology says, hey, the Earth has to be old for all of these geologic features to have formed. Later, astronomy pipes up and says, these stars are so far away that it took billions of years for the light from some of them to travel the distance to Earth. Then they all got together to compare notes and they said, hey, all of these things that we've discovered independently fit together pretty well, don't they? And that's when science said, yep, you guys are all correct. The Earth is old and the universe is even older. Listen to science, he's a pretty smart guy. And this is why you'll almost always hear Answers in Genesis use the phrase, the story of evolution, rather than the theory of evolution. Because they finally figured out that the word theory in science is used differently than what's used colloquially? That's progress, I guess. But it is a theory, and it is one of the most well-supported theories that we have. There's actually less evidence that supports the theory of gravity than there is for the theory of evolution, but you don't see creationists questioning that one. Except for the Flat Earthers. And as much distance as Answers in Genesis likes to keep from Flat Earthers, they are much closer to Flat Earth than they are to actual science. And that's because legitimate scientific theories have observational experimentation that helps verify them. So, like the E. coli long-term evolution experiment, which has been breeding E. coli almost non-stop since 1988, and observing their evolutionary development in that time? There have been hundreds of research papers published throughout the course of this experiment, and they have observed all sorts of evolutionary changes, everything from defects in the DNA repair mechanisms that allowed for greater mutation rates and faster adaptation, to an increase in size, to the development of ecological specialization, to the evolution of balanced polymorphism and simple ecosystems with separate strains of E. coli occupying different niches in the environment of the experiment, to the development of the ability to metabolize a new food source. Or how about the dark fly experiment, which has bred fruit flies in complete darkness for over 60 years and has seen several adaptations in the flies that help them survive in darkness? Or maybe you'd prefer the experiment where two strains of self-replicating RNA evolved into a whole mini ecosystem with at least five different strains of RNA evolving from the original two strains, forming parasite host relationships and even having a couple of them developing into interdependent relationships where both strains need the other in order to survive? There is lots of experimental evidence for evolution out there. You just have to, you know, look for it. And truthfully, with no observational experiment in support of it whatsoever, evolution should be described as a hypothesis at best. 
If you weren't flat out lying about the lack of experimental evidence, then maybe, well, no, still no. There is lots of evidence that doesn't really rely on experimental data. I mean, I guess depending on how you define experiment, like the fossil record, the existence of fertile hybrid species, the state of agriculture for both plants and animals, the existence of dogs, etc., etc., etc. And Anyway, however, for, you know, those that have grown up in state-run schools promoting evolutionary indoctrination, like myself here in Canada, many evolution believers, like Debbie, still think that evolution is a fact and that it's been observed. One of us had to rely on taking quotes out of context and trying to make the author of the quote sound more famous or impressive than they actually are, rather than just bringing data to the table. The other just brought data to the table. If the case against evolution is so strong, then surely you don't need to rely on quoting specific people about it and can instead just show some actual data yourself, right? Like, remember my earlier point about the appeal to authority fallacy? The way Calvin is appealing to the evolutionary authorities is fallacious. If the authority you are appealing to would disagree with your conclusion about what they are saying, then that is not a proper appeal to authority. That is a fallacious one. I didn't have to try and impress you with Yosuke Bansho's credentials and qualifications before quoting him talking about the experiment that shows the evolution of RNA ecosystems. I can just send you to the actual paper and news articles talking about the experiment that shows the evolution of RNA ecosystems. It's just a matter of fact that they saw a simple ecosystem spontaneously evolve through the course of their experiment. And if you start hearing rumbles right about now in the video, there's a thunderstorm happening right now, so that's why. I'm just gonna roll with it. I don't think it'll be too easy to hear on the recording, so eh, it's fine. Right? You guys like thunder anyway, right? I know I do. I find it relaxing. Tangent over. In 2008, the director of the National Center for Science Education, Dr. Eugenie Scott, um, criticized creationists in a presentation she was doing for one, preferring direct observation to inferential explanation, and two, insisting evolutionists should provide observ uh, observable evidence for their belief. See, again, instead of actually offering an explanation as to why any of the instances of observed evolution don't count, you're just appealing to quotes from an authority who would disagree with the way you are using her quotes. I mean, you heard that correctly. Instead of providing observational evidence of evolution happening, she declared that science doesn't require direct observation. It doesn't. Not always. Now, do you care to provide any direct observation that God created the universe? I know you guys like to appeal to the Bible as an eyewitness account, but how do you know it was written by eyewitnesses? Did you observe it being written? No, you did not. You are expecting a level of evidence for evolution that, if we apply the same standards to creationism, can just never be met. So why is the standard of evidence for evolution so much higher than it is for creationism? Why do we just have to accept an old book at its word without critically examining its claims, but for evolution, nothing short of direct observation over a timescale of at least a few hundred thousand years will suffice? and that evolutionary scientists can figure out what happened in the past based on observations in the present. Well, yeah, they can. And do. In fact, we all do. If you want to get really technical, nobody actually observes anything in the present, because our brains actually delay the processing of all inputs until it receives signals from every part of the body, so even though your eyes could see things in pretty close to real time, the brain delays the signal by a split second until it receives the input from your toes so that the signals can be coordinated. Which actually means that the taller you are, the farther in the past your experiences that you think of as now are. It's only a tiny fraction of a second, but it is measurable, and that means that all of our observations are of past events, even if it is the extremely recent past. My point is, even if we exclude the delayed processing thing that our brains do that I just spent too much time talking about, we would not be able to function in reality if we had to treat everything that we don't directly observe ourselves as tentative. And to make her point, <laughs> she actually used a uh, picture uh, of a paint stripe over top some cow dung stamped on a highway as an example of how we can logically infer uh, from the evidence conclusions about the order of events that we've you know never directly seen. Yeah, that is a good example. If you see some bullshit on the road with a road line painted on top of it, the reasonable inference is that the bullshit there before the line was painted. 
It is hypothetically possible that someone painted the bullshit in a different location and then made sure to match it to the road paint and then carefully placed it down to make it look just like that, but that's more than a bit of a wild claim and would require much more evidence than just the observation of the painted bullshit on the road. I, it was obvious that the road existed before the cow dung on top of it, which in turn existed before the paint stripe that was placed over top of it. It's kind of like, yeah, we, we get it. But this idea of arguing from analogy is similar to what creationists have done for years now to support the unobserved historical events recorded in God's word. The main difference is that the creationist analogies are pretty much always plagued by a fatal flaw that renders the entire analogy useless. But this also seems to be another variation of the I don't have enough faith to be an atheist thing. Making a point with an analogy is okay when creationists do it, but not when an evolutionist does it. Why? Who knows? Also, at least he's willing to admit that the events recorded in the Bible are completely unsupported. So yeah, we use the analogy of crap on the road and it analogizes something that is actually real and that's bad? You use an analogy to support something that you now admit is unsupported, but that one's good, I guess, for reasons. Except the examples that we have used are a direct blow to the story of evolution rather than some obvious trivial example of, you know, cows doing their thing on highways. Well, you didn't give us enough context from Dr. Scott's presentation for us to know what the analogy was referring to. If I had to guess, I'd say it was the relative dating of the stratigraphic layers, for which that is a good analogy. But anyway, let's hear one of the creationist analogies that blows evolution. I mean, is a blow to evolution. For example, when we see fossilized trees standing upright through several meters of sedimentary rock layers, we can logically assume that the layers were laid down very quickly before the trees rotted away. Why? Because dead trees rot out at the bottom, they dry out at the top, and then they fall over shortly after they die. Calvin, uh, do you know what an analogy is? I don't think he does. That That's not an analogy. That's just an upright fossil tree. And dead trees can stand for sometimes hundreds of years. And the sedimentary layers that surround these upright fossil trees are always the types of layers that are capable of forming in that time frame. So there's no blowing evolution here. Obviously, trees would not last standing up if it took several thousand years for sediments to build up around them. No, they wouldn't, which is why we never find them in the types of sediment that take thousands of years to build up. This ain't rocket science, buddy. And when we see unfossilized soft tissue, containing red blood vessels, cells, amino acid sequences, collagen, etc. Okay, yeah, Calvin doesn't have the slightest idea what an analogy is. I'm not bothering with the soft tissue thing, I'll just link to a playlist that I've put together that has several videos from several different channels explaining the soft tissue thing. And that's basically the end of it. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Moody Rick, who says, The serpent is Satan? If God sentenced the serpent to crawl on his belly forever, how did he end up walking with Jesus in the desert and attempting to seduce slash test him with riches? Well, that's a good point. I'm not entirely sure how creationists square the idea with the serpent being Satan, with Satan obviously not suffering from the curse that God laid on the serpent. But if I had to guess, given that I have read an AIG article that attempts to explain how the Bible was correct when it said that serpents eat the dust of the ground, I'd say that they probably think that the serpent was an actual snake that was possessed by Satan, and so the curse of God on the serpent was actually directed at snakes for allowing the possession to happen. Which seems massively unfair for the snakes if you ask me, but hey, the god of the Bible has never really been much for fairness, so that tracks. One announcement before I go, I have hired Tim Robertson to be my Patreon manager, and because I have someone else to do the Patreon stuff for me now, I've decided that rather than continuously thanking the same handful of people by name at the end of my videos, I will thank all of my new patrons by name after their first paid month of patronage. So for my existing patrons, I don't want to leave you out, but I know that there are at least some of you who want to remain anonymous. So. Better safe than sorry, I will not be reading any of my current patrons' names out until I get a positive confirmation from them that they want me to. So if that's you, shoot me a quick message over on Patreon with your confirmation and I'll add you to the list. Or rather, Tim will, because that's what I pay him for now. Yay! Also, if you've been on the fence about becoming a patron, now's a good time, because I just hired my first ever regular staff type person, so that'll help. I'm actually a little bit nervous about that. We'll see. 
And I also might grandfather in the people whose names I've been reading every episode thus far, since they did sign up with that specific benefit listed. I'll see how they feel about that, and if that's you, check your messages, I already sent you one. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, Clint Cheesewood, Mark McManus, Mark Hetchum, and all the rest, who are the Steves that murdered my channel on camera with a witness nearby. If you'd like creationists to insist on your innocence despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vicerhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time. My point is... Thunder. Thunder.